I feel really comfortable with grief. I think that's largely because my mother was diagnosed with stage four breast cancer when I was 13 and lived another 13 years before she died when I was 26. And it meant that grief was around our house and I always wanted to figure out how I could help her more with the grief she was experiencing. Before I did the very first neuroimaging study of grief, I think it was a bit mysterious when I told people this is what I wanted to do. The way that I thought about it was, if we can have someone who is lying in a neuroimaging scanner and they're having that wave of grief, we'll get a better sense of what that requires in the brain. Here at the University of Arizona, I direct the Grief, Loss, and Social Stress Lab, which we call the GLASS Lab. And I have a number of graduate students and undergraduates uh, who help me in research, looking at the consequences of grief for the brain and the body. People with complicated grief spend more dwell time in one of the networks that they're in. I'm a graduate researcher, um, so I collaborate with Mary Frances on research projects, uh, helping to collect data, helping to formulate questions. And this helps me within my clinical work, so I'm also trained as a therapist. And so I see clients and I'm able to give them insight um, to a, a process that feels very like emotional, but it's actually a very concrete thing happening in the brain. If you think about it, the brain is a prediction machine. The heart is there to pump blood around the body. The brain is there really to try and predict what's going to happen next for us and, and maybe help us prepare for it a little bit. And it gets those predictions from thousands and thousands of days of experience. And so when a loved one dies, if you think about it this way, if you wake up one morning and your, your wife isn't next to you there in bed, it's actually not a very good prediction to think that she's died, right? And many bereaved people will recognize the experience of waking up and thinking for a few minutes that their loved one is still alive. And then the wave of the reality hits them. And I think that comes from the attachment bond, which is a different kind of information that the brain can rely on. When we bond with our one and only, when we fall in love with our partner or our child, that bonding includes the belief that you will be there for me and I will be there for you, and that will always be true. And so the solution that the brain has for, if my loved one isn't present, then the answer is to go get them, to go find them, or to create enough fuss that they will come and find you. And so that solution, of course, doesn't work in the case of the death of a loved one. And so it takes a long time for the brain to sort of reconcile these mutually exclusive pieces of information. There's a newer model that we use in current grief research uh, called the dual process model. And this model really helps us to understand that there are two different kinds of stressors that bereaved people have to cope with. On the one hand, there are the loss stressors, and this is what we think of usually as grief. But there are these other set of stressors called restoration stressors, and this is really about restoring a meaningful life. What is it that I do now that I find meaningful? So the advantage of thinking about both kinds of stressors means that for mental health, we try to find ways to cope with both. And people can get stuck in only one or only the other. It really is more about being able to do both aspects, to fondly reflect on the time that you spent together, maybe even experience that bittersweetness that comes with it, and also to be able to engage in how things are now.
many grieving people will recognize what I like to call the should've, would've, could've. Some very elegant research studies have shown us that this kind of rumination can actually be thought of as a form of avoidance. These are those thoughts that just keep running around in your head of, if only they could have known that the train was gonna be late, or if only the doctor would have run another test, or often about themselves, if I would have gotten them to the hospital sooner. The difficulty with the would have, could have, should have is if you think about it, each of those stories ends in, and then my loved one didn't die. But of course they did die. And so getting stuck in that kind of rumination doesn't really help us to adapt to the current situation, the painful reality that we have to deal with that is there gone. I think it can be really helpful to make a distinction between grief and grieving. And grief is just that, it's that feeling that overwhelms you like a wave. Grieving, on the other hand, is the way that that feeling changes over time without ever really going away. So the reason I think it's most helpful to distinguish between them is that if people believe there will come a time when they don't feel grief, they're gonna be disappointed. You know, if I open a drawer, I open a book, and I see a birthday card my mom sent, right? I'm gonna be totally overwhelmed with grief in that moment, you know, seeing her handwriting. And that's totally normal, even though it's been years and years and years and years. And the intensity, the frequency of those waves of grief will change over time, but it doesn't mean that it's ever over in some sense. So there's a huge range in the way that people express the grief that they're experiencing, and almost all of it is normal. Things I tell people that can be helpful are if there are moments of your day when you can feel positive things, that you can you know, be distracted by um, a puppy loping in the park, or you can have a funny moment with your grandkid where you're, where you're laughing about something, even if there are other parts of the day where you feel just bereft, it's really the flexibility of being able to sort of go in and out of these waves of grief that's a sign of mental health. We do think about a small proportion of people, maybe five or 10% of people who experience the loss of a loved one, who have a more prolonged and severe type of grief. We don't even begin to start looking at that as a possibility until at least a year after the death has happened. At that point, we're really able to look for those individuals who are not functioning very well. And so the opportunity exists then to intervene and get them back on a typical trajectory of grief and not actually take their grief away, but help them to find that flexibility in their life. My father died about six years ago. And I think as with most grief experiences, we never know what it's gonna be like until it hits us. Even someone who studied grief as much as I have can be surprised by what comes along with it. But I knew that the feelings would change over time and it was easier for me to just let those waves come over me and then also recede. So life experience taught me a lot and having talked to so many grieving people taught me a lot as well. <laughs>